Hello everyone, in the last video we came up with the problem of reset deassertion that led us to the issue of metastability. So let's try to solve that problem using reset synchronizers. Okay, so reset synchronizers are nothing but a piece of circuit that comes and sits between the reset end line and the end of different flop. So let's see how the circuitry works. So we'll add two different, we'll remove the main reset line and add two different reset synchronizer flops. And the reset synchronizer flops are nothing but the regular flops but with, with some doing some different functionality. It will work as a flip flop but, but these connections will be will be in such a fashion that these two flops will function a bit differently so let's try to add the reset line to the reset synchronizers flop 1 and flop 2 okay and then the, the certain connections that we need to do is we need to take, we need to take or tie the tie the deep in of the fl first flip flop to logic 1 or to vdd and then we need to take a connection from q to d of the reset one uh, of the of the flop 1 to flop 2 and then we need to take an output from the q which is called as a master reset n and this master reset n is the one that will trigger and that will that will basically reset all the flip flops in your design so let me try to show you how does what are the waveforms for the master reset and looks like and how does it solves the problems of reset deassertion okay so we'll come up with the timing graph so let's try to let's try to start from the same problem that we saw in the in the last video so for example this was the area where where whenever you deasserted your reset line it led to metastability because it was happening very close to the active edge of the clock okay so let's try to see how do we solve this let's take one example of it will take let's say we'll will deassert the reset uh, reset signal just right opposite right next to the active edge of the clock so now what happens when this circuitry functions we'll will do that first we'll remove the some extra piece of circuitry which is not needed and let's try to let's try to focus only on this one so this is the this is the clock this is the reset and this is the waveform this is the line for your master reset and let's see how does it work so during the line from this point till this point whenever you get a reset signal at the reset underscore n at the reset underscore end port things works in the same fashion it is to work before basically both the flops will get resetted and your master underscore n master underscore reset uh, reset line will follow the same waveform that you have for the master reset line or that you have for the main reset line so let's do that and let's assume an initial condition of one so if the initial condition of master master reset pin was one this is how it will look like okay at this particular point whenever your reset goes down both the reset synchronizer flops get resetted and your output output it basically zeros so whenever we say zero it says basically both the flops are resetted now okay now comes the point where you, where you receive the active edge of the clock where the both the flops receives the active edge of the clock and you receive a reset underscore n very close to the active edge of the clock in that case what will happen there will be still metastability problem but that problem gets get sorted out whenever we move further so let's see how do we do it so for example example in this case wherever there is an active edge of the clock whenever this particular flop receives an active edge of the clock this flop goes into a metastability state and the output for this particular flop rs1 is unknown that's why i've shown a crossover here we don't know what is the output because it has gone into a setup violation or or, kind, or or those kind of violation things so during that case you don't see you can't predict what is the output and that's why the output of the rs1 flop goes to a metastable state okay so what happens next let's let's try to remove the remove the initial clock and let's try to move more cycles to the, towards the right we'll move this thing to the left and add some more clock cycles okay we'll add this first clock cycle and the second clock cycle so at the first clock cycle after your reset deassertion things will change uh, things will behave a bit differently so let's let's look into that and the master reset and is still at zero because that was the condition that it maintained just in the previous clock cycle so let's do that when when we move further in this particular case your outputs still remains zero because a master reset and flop has not received the new output of of your rs1 but there is one change over here in the first clock cycle now that reset n is completely one your output your output of the rs1 flop will be one which is which is there at the input that is vdd so at this particular edge you see a vdd going over here so at the first clock cycle now you see a vdd over in the previous clock cycle the data was not known to uh, the data was very unknown over here it went into a metastable state because of the because of this whole time violation for for this particular clock edge but at the but at the next clock edge the reset underscore n has already been settled and and the first clock cycle after your reset reset deassertion it sees a logic one it sees a it sees a clear data there is no data change at this particular active edge of your clock cycle and as a result of that you see logic one getting propagated to the output of rs1 okay, in the first clock cycle and your output of the rs2 still remains zero because this thing has not been has not been yet propagated to the next clock 
cycle it will happen in only in the next clock cycle and that's what happened in the second clock cycle in the next clock cycle the input of the input of the rs1 will still be hold at vdd because there is no activity on the reset end signal but this particular one the signal which is present at the output of rs1 will now enter into the rs2 and move out of the rs2 so this is how it will look like so now your master reset has been a master reset signal has been set to logic one at the correct clock cycle so this actually solves the problem of the of, of the of the metastability issue and the reason is because after the after you see the metastable it takes after you see the reset deassertion that leads to metastability it takes at least two clock cycles to reach a stable state and that's how we achieve the the reset deassertion issue and that's how we work around the reset deassertion issue now comes the most important thing what happens next so what where does this reset sing, signal goes so this reset signal goes back to the different flops that we already have so this reset pin will bring the circuit back to its original position and this is the one that goes to your master that that goes to your this flop and also goes to the remaining flops that is present in your design okay so instead of directly connecting the reset and signal to the flop which we synchronize the reset line with respect to the clock signal and then send the master reset signal to the rest of the flops and that makes and that solves the problem of reset deassertion now this is nothing but a regular flop to flop but it's nothing but a regular reg to reg path so now you can think about the asynchronous check that we started with in the initial in, in the in the beginning of this particular section so let's see how does it look like so first of all clock tree there will be a clock tree already built up for this flop and for the other flops as well so you might want to look into my clock tree synthesis course to, to see how does this clock tree is getting built Okay, so there will be a clock tree right from the clock pin to the to the different flops and similar to a clock tree there will be a reset tree as well. Okay, and and things has to be very clear that the reset tree is in is in par with the clock tree. That should be the 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 skew between the reset and this clock should be as minimal as minimal as possible. But there is one advantage of having a reset tree. The reset the skew between the reset tree need not be similar, but the skew between the reset tree and the clock tree is expected to be minimal. And in this way, this becomes this particular. If you if you now remove the remaining entire of the circuitry and focus only on RS two and flip flop two, this will look like your rest to rest path. Okay, so it, in in your in a normal rest to rest path, you had something which is going out of the queue, going through the commercial circuit to the D pin. In this case, it's the same thing. It just the queue is going to some set of some set of circuitry. It could be a set of buffers or some set of gates that will create the reset signal, and it in eventually goes to a reset pin. So instead of the D, now you have the reset pin, and this is where you do your setup and hold check, which are called as recovery and removal checks respectively. So let me show you that first. So first of all, this becomes your delta one. So you uh, so uh, so what does delta one say? Delta one is nothing but your launch clock network delay. So you might want to look into my clock tree synthesis course to understand what is delta one and all those and all these terms. So delta one is is your launch clock network delay. Your this the, from clock to this particular D pin or or the, from the clock to this particular reset pin of the flip flop two, it becomes a Commercial delay theta. So theta also is the one which we have talked about in STA part one course. You might want to have a look into that. So theta is your commercial delay, okay? And your delta two is your capture clock network delay. Now once you have delta two, delta one, and theta, you can always solve your. You can always come up with a setup and hold equation, which is which is now called as a reset and recovery, as a removal and re recovery equations. Because just because of the presence or just because of the, just because of the signal going to the reset pin of the flops. For example, let's try to take some values. Over here, okay. So we'll assume the clock is one nanosecond, and we'll also assume the L L R C D, which is nothing but the library recovery time as twenty three picosecond. This is very 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 similar to the to the library setup time. So it will be called as library recovery time, and these values are the ones which are already present in the library in the in the library for the flop. So so we have to use this one. So li your library recovery time is twenty three picosecond, and now if if you if you look into the equations for your setup time, basically in the one which we have seen in the S T A part one course, the same. Equation we have to take and we have to replace the setup time, the library setup time, by the library recovery time, and that's the equation for your, and that becomes the basically your equation for your recovery for your recovery check. So theta plus delta one becomes your arrival time. This is this is this complete path. This is your arrival time. The data required time is t plus delta two, which is your delta two plus your clock period, which is t minus the library recovery time minus the setup uncertainty. So we have talked about setup uncertainty in the in the STA part one course. The new thing over here is the library recovery time, and that's what we need to focus. Focus on. So everything else remains the same. It is as good as your setup check. Only the library setup time has been now replaced by library recovery time. Okay. So your data arrival time minus or your data required time minus data arrival time is called as a slack. This is called. This is nothing but your recovery check. And this is called this is called as a recovery slack. So in your timing reports, you might see the recovery and removal violations. When you see the re recovery violations, this is what it actually means. 
okay next we also have the removal volitions it is very similar to your hold volition so let's look into that the equation for the hold volitions you must have seen but before that let's try to introduce some new terms over here we'll assume that the t is one nanosecond it is we don't we don't care about the t equal to one nanosecond for your hold volition the important part is over here is lrlt which is library removal time and we have kept it as 1.9 picosecond so instead of the library hold time we call it as library removal time things remains the same only because this is associated with the reset signal it's called as a removal time and this check is referred to as a removal check the equation for your hold represents the same thing your basically data require your data arrival time is theta plus delta 1 which is this complete thing your data required time is lr lt plus delta 2 plus hold uncertainty which is which is this delta 2 plus your okay, plus your library removal time plus the hold uncertainty we have talked about the uncertainty in the in the past videos and your slack remains the same basically your data arrival time minus data required time becomes a slack only this in this case it will be called as a removal check or a removal slack okay so that was about the recovery and the removal checks then that was one section of your asynchronous checks there's another section of the asynchronous checks which is nothing but the pulse of it but before that we'll look into the data to data checks now data to data check is nothing but a very very easy check it is very similar to your setup and the whole check only that it happens on the data pins so let's begin with the data to data check in the next video thank you